This video is brought to you by Squarespace. Stay tuned to learn more. In the early years of the Pokémon series, it had become tradition to pair every new generation of Pokémon with its own home console counterpart. After all, who wouldn't want to take their Pokémon off their tiny handheld and see them battle on the TV? For the first two generations, there was Pokémon Stadium and Pokémon Stadium 2, two games that served their purpose well as battle simulators. However, with the advent of Gen 3, the successor to the Stadium games would go above and beyond its predecessors in ways nobody saw coming. Hello everyone, this is the RPG Monger, and today I want to talk about Pokémon Coliseum. Developed by the newly formed second party developer Genius Sonority, Pokémon Coliseum would share many similarities to its stadium predecessors. Much like them, it could also serve as a battle simulator where you can pit the various Pokémon the game gives you against AI opponents. And if you happen to own the special link cable that connected the Game Boy Advance to the GameCube, you could also use Pokémon you've trained in the mainline Gen 3 games. Though as opposed to the two stadium games, the battle modes are more of a side attraction than anything because this time the game had a full-blown story mode, practically bursting with uniqueness from every angle, the main campaign here takes the core gameplay of Pokémon and twists it into something entirely new. Rather than going around filling your Pokédex through random encounters, here Colosseum decided to get rid of random encounters outright. It's a pretty drastic change, considering those random encounters are one of the main things Pokémon was built off of, but the way they replaced them couldn't have been done better. Instead of catching wild Pokémon, our protagonist Wes gets rid of that hassle by just taking them from other trainers. Having never played Colosseum until recently, it's pretty shocking to find that out the first time around. I never thought there'd be a Pokémon game that focused on the actual Pokémon thieves each game uses as antagonists. Only to justify this mechanic, Wes is actually an ex-member of this region's Pokémon thieves, the Pokémon made available to snag also coming with some caveats. Since while it'd be hilarious if you could, not every Pokémon you fight in trainer battles can be caught. It's solely when a special Shadow Pokémon shows up in battle that Wes can attempt to catch it. And that's not all, because upon rescuing a Shadow Pokémon, your job isn't over. On top of snagging a Shadow Pokémon from the trainer that had one, you've also got to purify said Shadow Pokémon in order for it to return entirely to normal. No matter what Shadow Pokémon you have, upon using it in battle, they'll only have the move Shadow Rush, which isn't the worst move all things considered since it ignores typing, but comes with the downside of having recoil. Alongside that, Shadow Pokémon will sometimes just disobey you entirely when they enter Hyper Mode. In this unique status, attacks do get powered up, but with the downside of unpredictability and the chance to even attack a trainer. Glad to see that last part lived on past Colosseum. In turn, as you continue to use a Shadow Pokémon in battle, their heart gauge will slowly deplete unlocking various aspects of that Pokémon in the process. Initially, it may only be a move or two, but the more you use them, other things will get revealed like their nature or ability. I guess to play devil's advocate here, it can get a bit grindy with all the Pokémon at your disposal to purify, though it never really bothered me at all. If you calm a Pokémon down from Hyper Mode, it'll speed things up by a lot. The way they structured the purification process makes it really rewarding when you realize that all of a sudden, your Pokémon relearned a powerful move. Plus, upon purification, there's nothing better than watching all the experience the Pokémon had gotten as a Shadow Pokémon converted into levels all at once. Even after playing for a few hours, this new system already captivated me entirely. Which is saying something considering it's been a while since any Pokémon game has really had that effect on me. Especially as someone who's played nearly every Pokémon game in existence, Colosseum still managed to take me out of my comfort zone through limiting the Pokémon available to catch. Despite it being a Gen 3 game, this had me trying out Pokémon I'd normally never use, which was honestly pretty refreshing. And the best part is, Genius Sonority did didn't stop there. Next to the brand new Shadow Pokémon system, battles would also receive a notable distinction from their mainline counterparts. Only instead of creating something entirely new again, the devs decided to just utilize what already existed. Simply put, throughout the entire single-player campaign of Pokémon Coliseum, every battle is a double battle. It's such a simple change, but at the same time, it's also genius. Sure, double battles do appear occasionally in the mainline games, but they've always felt a bit underused along with the other alternate battle styles that have been created. So to feature them front and center here, forces the player to strategize far more than usual for a Pokémon game, many moves built for double battles becoming far more integral than they ever were in the normal games. And with that tweak of the formula, these permanent double battles serve to make Colosseum much more challenging from the get-go. Alongside providing the player more freedom to create unique teams geared for double battles, this change gave the devs of the game just as much freedom to create some truly formidable fights. Take one battle where you've got to go against a team who keeps utilizing Earthquake against you. Sure, it's a devastating attack considering it usually hits both of 
your Pokémon, but using it on a double battle is a double-edged sword, considering it'll also harm one of your own Pokémon as well. So to circumvent that, this battle in particular would alternate between one Pokémon using Protect and the other using Earthquake. That way, the enemy could still deal a great deal of damage while also keeping their Pokémon secure. And if you get unlucky by targeting the Pokémon using Protect, well, better get ready to bust out some revives. While Game Freak has long laid out the building blocks to create powerful teams based on a strategy like this, it's not all that common that they actually utilize them in a proper in-game battle. Hell, there's a good few opponents in this game that if I hadn't played through myself, could have easily come off as something right out of competitive Pokémon. I guess that's one way to differentiate the gameplay between handheld Pokémon and home console Pokémon. Though before I go into any more depth with the different battles this game offers, I feel it's about time I go into the plot of the game. As if it hadn't already separated itself enough from the mainline games, Colosseum's campaign opens up unlike any other Pokémon before it. Rather than starting out in the newest region's cozy hometown, we're in the desolate Ore region, West receiving quite possibly the best introduction out of any Pokémon protagonist yet. I don't know what's cooler, the fact that the game literally opens with him betraying his evil syndicate, or him getting away on his hoverbike thing. In a way, it's almost as if the game is starting in the middle of another story altogether, some series of unknown events leading to West going so far to explode his former base. It's a nice touch that the game starts you off with an Umbreon and Espeon, since aside from them being great Pokémon, it shows Wes actually put in the time to build up the friendship of two Eevees. And even though he's a silent protagonist, things like that serve to subtly flesh him out, as if he's been shown to care for his Pokémon that much, it stands to reason that he's not going to let other Pokémon get abused by being Shadow Pokémon. From the very beginning, it's undeniable that Colosseum is practically oozing with style. It makes sense that in a dusty region like this that barely has any wild Pokémon to speak of, much of the region would be home to an expansive criminal enterprise. So much so that in the second locale you go to in the game, Wes manages to save a girl named Rui that had been kidnapped. Apparently, Rui has a latent ability to distinguish between normal and shadow Pokémon, allowing Wes the opportunity to take back all the Pokémon that were corrupted. Though sadly, her becoming a partner comes at a price, because as a trade-off for all the cool things Colosseum does, the devs decided to give Rui full collision. Take note, this is why you can usually walk through party members in most RPGs. And despite the game locking you in with an Umbreon and Espeon, there is kind of a choice when it comes to starters in Colosseum. Only rather than being outright presented with your choices, the Gen 2 starters you can get as Shadow Pokémon are solely hinted at by the color of the trainer you choose to fight here. Usually it isn't something you really pick up on your first time through, but it's a neat way to include such an ingrained Pokémon tradition in a more secretive way. Then, kicking things off with this game's notorious higher difficulty, even Or's Trainer School has some challenge involved. When you come back later with a full party of Pokémon, the fight with a largely evasion-focused team definitely becomes annoying fast if you're not prepared. Anyways, moving ahead a bit to the next town, I've got to give props to Colosseum's soundtrack. Fitting the dusty urban settings of the game, the jazzy tunes they made stand out amongst the sea of Pokémon themes. I love the emphasis on instruments like the acoustic guitar or harmonica. It almost adds a nostalgic feeling to a lot of the locations, despite me having only played the game recently. Though even better than those are the multitude of battle themes in this game. Whereas the acoustic guitar was great in Colosseum's area themes, its electric counterpart absolutely made some of these battle themes. Even after the infinite amount of battles in this game, the tracks never got old. But of course, above everything is the absolutely beautiful theme for a certain character that I even knew about before playing Colosseum. Which brings me to what I'm sure you'd all agree is the true god of the Pokémon world, Mirror B. Step aside literally every villainous Pokémon team, because Cypher is automatically one of the best for having Mirror B as a member. Seriously, as far as admins go, there's no competition. And if his immense aura of Groove isn't enough to sell you, his fight is, as when you reach him at the end of the Pyrite City scenario, you'd better be sure you've prepared. Because this absolute legend has not one, not two, but four Ludicolos on his team, each well-equipped to spam Rain Dance. Oh, and he's got a Sudowoodo in there too. This is what I'm talking about when it comes to Colosseum's great team comps. Mirror Bees may not be one of the harder ones per se, but the sheer ridiculousness of it elevates the fight that much more. Luckily, by this point, I'd already started purifying a Skip Plume and Quagsire, so I managed to sleep cheese my way through this one. Then, after conquering the God of Groove, your reward for that scenario is a stolen Plusle joining your team. So after taking down some Cypher members to gain access to the area where Shadow Pokémon can be purified, we've hit Mount Battle. Along with going back to areas to refight trainers, Mount Battle is this game's go-to place for grinding. It's worth it too, as there's some solid rewards to be had if you do it enough. Though right now, you've got to take the mountain back from the Cypher admin occupying it before anything. As far as all these little scenarios go, I'd probably say this one is the most mundane, but it makes up for it with one hell of a finishing fight. Like I mentioned earlier, in this battle, with Cypher admin Akeem, you've got to figure out a way to circumvent his Earthquake-centric team. It's a pretty tall order, especially if you're not equipped to deal with Fire Rock or Ground types. However, what I didn't mention before is towards the end of this battle, things go from 100 to 1000. 
end with Takim sending out a Shadow Entei of all things. It's one thing to deal with a challenging fight, but to then have to also manage to catch a Legendary all the while trying not to die is something else entirely. In my case, I just barely managed to squeeze out a victory through some tactical sleep cheese. RNG was definitely on my side in that regard. Thankfully, the game rewards you properly for such a victory with an item that can instantly purify any Shadow Pokémon. A pretty big deal, all things considered, since there's only three in the entire game. Thus, with Colosseum taking off the training wheels and proceeding to hit you over the head with them, there's still a whole half of the game left. This video is sponsored by Squarespace. Now I'm sure you already know that when it comes to creating a website with ease, Squarespace is the way to go. After all, it doesn't get more simple than utilizing one of their many templates and customizing things to your heart's content. But what you may not know is Squarespace isn't only for something like an online store or a personal blog, it can also be used for all sorts of personal projects. Take the kids in Pokemon Coliseum who help Wes take back Shadow Pokemon from Cypher. They could have absolutely benefited from Squarespace by using the service to create a forum for spreading information on Cypher's activities. It would have saved Wes a good amount of trips to to their HQ, that's for sure. So if you have a website-centric passion project you want to pursue, or just want to take down a criminal empire, do go to squarespace.com slash rpgmonger for your free trial and 10% off your purchase of a website or domain. And speaking of those kids, it's time for the under. Following the Keem scenario, Wes finds himself in the criminal underbelly of the Ore region, a fittingly named The Under. It may be due to it reminding me of that one theme from Final Fantasy VI, but I adore the track that plays here. Coliseum definitely got everything they could out of that snapping sample, though with this area being filled with various members of Cypher, it's only natural that another one of their admins would be here. Thus, in the ensuing fight with Venus, hope you're ready to handle a track mechanics. As if that evasion focus battle from before wasn't bad enough, here, if you're unlucky with the genders on your team, you're in for a swift defeat. Nothing like setting up an attack to wipe out an enemy Pokemon only to get attracted into oblivion. I will admit my view of this fight is a bit skewed, since I was a bit underleveled and RNG suddenly stopped working in my favor, but I'd still say this one is challenging regardless. Who in the right mind expects a Steelix to have attract? I know I didn't. Even more shocking is just like Takim, Venus has another catchable legendary at the end of her team, this time coming in the form of a Suicune. Panic inducement aside, they should do this more often in Pokemon as a whole, just inexplicably giving an opponent something crazy crazy like a legendary. It makes these fights so much more memorable compared to their mainline counterparts. So after getting another legendary, that only leaves one more Cypher admin to take care of. Except real quick before that, there's another very necessary and important fight you can go take care of. It's a bit of a trek, but if after Venus you go back to where you fought Mirror B, in his place is a disgusting imitation. He doesn't even have a single Ludicolo. Jokes aside, Miracle B was a decently challenging fight when I fought him. For one, he's the first fight I encountered where the devs coded him to switch out Pokemon that'd been yawned. I'll give him one thing, at least Miracle B managed to have a pseudo Wudo as his last Pokemon. Didn't do much with it self-destructing in the end. Anyways, with the creator of penis music defeated, let's go back to the main story. Going into the labs Cypher used to make shadow Pokemon, this part, much like the Keem scenario, is packed full of battles. On one hand, it's good for getting some leveling done, but it does get slightly annoying towards the end as the only healing machine nearby is all the way at the start of the area. Though making up for that, this area continues the trend of all music associated with Cypher being an absolute banger. That are Monica is so good. Plus, there's also a catchable Vibrava in one of the battles here. And let's be honest, that Vibrava made it onto nearly everybody's Colosseum teams, at least for a bit. It's practically a Flygon with how close to evolving it is. I know I talked about it a bit ago with Miracle B, but the smarter AI found in Colosseum battles deserves serious praise. Just another example here, in the same fight where you catch Vibrava, there was a Kadabra who saved itself by stealing my Quagsire's ability Water Absorb. It might have been random chance that it did that to be fair, but stuff like that is something I'd expect out of a real-life player not some random trainer battle. Then in the fight with the last Cypher admin, the strats bestowed upon this fight by the devs are a combination between Rain and Confuse Ray spamming with a side of Thunder. All in all, it isn't easy. In my case, there was added difficulty at the start of the fight since Golbat's idle animation kept cracking me up. Look at him go! Compared to the other admins, admittedly, Venus did give me a bit more trouble than I, but the combination of his Lantern and Altaria was no joke. I had to resort to taking out Altaria purely through Toxic. Oh, and Raikou was there too. As I had two ground types on my team at this point, it was a pretty easy catch. And just like that, with all three admins defeated, we're headed for the game's final area.
Taking place in the finished Realgum Tower that's been teased for most of the game, it was at this point that I realized my team needed some serious grinding. Because from the get-go, to get anywhere in the towers, you've gotta have a rematch with all four Cypher admins. He may have noticeably less Ludicolos, but Mirabee's new fight brings the pain. That end pairing of Armaldo and Ludicolo still gave me trouble despite all the grinding I had to do. It's a shame, if Mirabee had just played his theme in this fight too, he'd have easily been unstoppable. Next with Akeem, he's not nearly as menacing compared to his first fight, as I now knew his strat all too well. Well, my team was more than capable of taking out his, despite the new Pokémon added to the team. Can't say the same for Rhyme though, since to protect the water types on his team, his strat got modified to have Pokémon with Lightning Rod. However, as long as you can keep his Starmie asleep while taking care of the Lightning Rod Pokémon, there's not much more to this battle. Same situation with Venus, the only real challenge there being her new Melotic at the end. Funny how out of them all, Mirror B went from being the weakest to the strongest. In turn, with them taken care of, we're in the home stretch, a whole slew of battles awaiting Wes in the last few portions of the tower. Even the leader of Wes's old team from the beginning of the game shows up to fight. With him, it's not that any of his Pokémon were particularly hard, it's that his Shadow Skarmory was insanely hard to catch. Maybe you all had a different experience, but I wasted a ton of balls only for it to just Shadow Rush itself to death. And after him, it's the final tournament of the main story, each fight getting progressively harder until at the end, you've got to fight the apparent leader of Cypher, Nascor. In this battle with Riku and Kuja's love child, the Pokémon here are seriously strong. Opening with two strong Psychic types that can cripple your team if you're not careful, Nascor goes so far to even use X specials. Then, later into his fight, his Shadow Metagross was a nightmare to catch. Didn't help that in order to make things as tense as physically possible, the devs decided to back this fight with pure silence. Only in an actually shocking turn of events, Nascor wasn't the leader of Cypher all along. Revealed after the fight, the real leader of Cypher is the mayor of the first town you go to in the game, Escade, or rather, Evis. Take note, X and Y, this is how you properly mask the leader of your villains. You don't have them clearly sporting the same style as the antagonists all game, you make it the most unassuming old man imaginable. Hell, despite them hinting at it earlier with Nascor leaving his house, I still didn't see it coming purely due to how minor of a character he appeared to be. Thankfully, Colosseum is gracious enough to heal your Pokémon before this fight because you'll need it. You thought Nascor's Gardevoir and Zatu were rough? In reality, they're nothing compared to Evis's opening Pokémon when he sends out a Slacking and a Slowking. You might be thinking to yourself, how can that be worse than two all-powerful Psychic types? Well, in true competitive Pokémon fashion, a Slow King is there to swap away Slacking's ability Truant, making Slacking into a truly terrifying opponent. Wait a second. <gasps> oh no, it doesn't have Truant! Oh, 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 oh no! Kill, 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 kill. Despite me not really playing Pokémon for a while before Colosseum, even I knew that slacking without Truant is a force to be reckoned with. It's a miracle that I somehow managed to take it down before I suffered too many losses. And while that's without a doubt the scariest part of this fight, the rest of his Pokémon are decently hard too. His Shadow Tyranitar at the end was practically impossible for me to catch, due in part to his Machamp literally murdering it before I could even try. I guess despite their best efforts, Pokémon AI will always have a bit of jank. So with that, as Ho-Oh appears briefly to aid Wes, that's the end of Colosseum. Main scenario. There is a bit of post game to be had here, with the Snagum based West Blew Up becoming accessible, but it's more for you getting all the Shadow Pokemon in the game more than anything. In fact, if you complete all of Mount Battle after purifying every Shadow Pokemon, that Ho Oh is actually obtainable, which is a nice completion bonus, all things considered. What a great game! It may be a bit on the shorter side compared to its mainline counterparts, though there's no denying that Pokémon Colosseum went above and beyond what people expected out of Pokémon. Fantastic battles aside, the game aces everything down to the very animations themselves. It's not always perfect, as you can tell that they reused models from Stadium, but throughout playing, I was consistently shocked at how vibrant the animations were across all the Pokémon. For a good lot of them, their damage and feigning animations are up to snuff with what Pokémon's been doing today. You can tell the devs put a ton of love into all of them. Honestly, I hope one day there's another Pokemon game with a really unique setting like this. But I digress. Beyond that, Colosseum also served a pretty important purpose at the time of its release. Since with many of the Shadow Pokemon you get being from the first two generations, Colosseum became a good way to help fill out the national decks and its mainline counterparts. In a time before Mystery Gifts, Colosseum's pre-order bonus disc was the first way you could get Jirachi. Taking everything into account, it should come as no surprise that Pokemon Colosseum was a smash hit. So much so that not long after Colosseum, it received its own sequel in the form of Pokemon XD, Gale 
Veil of Darkness. And while I'm definitely gonna stream my first playthrough of that like I did with Colosseum, there's been another Pokemon game that released recently that I need to try out. After all, Pokemon Legends Arceus is the first time in a good while that there's been a new Pokemon game on a home console that significantly modifies the core Pokemon formula. In turn, tonight at 8pm EST, I'll be going into it 100% blind. Do stop by. So in the end, that's Pokemon Colosseum, a fantastic change of pace for the series that still to this day maintains its renown. To those who've continued to help out the channel, I'd like to give a heartfelt thanks to everyone who's decided to contribute. You guys are the best. If you want to help me continue making more videos like these and receive a special thank you amongst a lot of other bonus stuff, do check out my Patreon, a link in the description. It's pretty wild how at this rate, I'm beginning to run out of Pokemon spinoffs to cover. I definitely do want to cover XD in the coming months, but beyond that, there is another particular Pokemon spinoff I've talked about in the past that I'd like to cover in greater detail. We'll see when I can get around to it with everything I have planned. So that being said, I'm the RPG Monger, and don't forget that each and every one of you are fantastic.